So thanks for letting me be with you. It's kind of funny to be able to be asynchronously dropping into this conversation while I'm actually driving in a car on my way to Vancouver for the online community enthusiast meetup and Northern Voice, the social media conference, formerly Bloggers Conference, both of which are terrific, I might add. But you're there, so you can't be there. So we find ways to be together in new ways. And, and that's really one of the messages in my little conversation today. So I'd, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about uh, this is what I thought it was, community in the network age, because I think things have changed, and it's worth revisiting what we mean and then thinking about some strategies to be effective within this new time. So the first thing I want to do, though, is thank Lisa, Val, and Ian for inviting me to be part of this, because, you know, I think about this stuff all the time. I'm probably obsessive about this stuff. And I have lots of questions, and I can't do it alone, which is, in fact, the reason why this idea of community is incredibly important. So let's start off with thinking about what do we really mean by community? Because, after all, it's one of those words that's co-opted, abused, used, reused, and hung out to dry on a regular basis. Think of the various dot-com booms that have happened that have embraced the idea of online community, even when perhaps they mean something different than community. So let's Let's dive into that. Now, a lot of the thinking that I'm going to share with you, I want to attribute to my thinking partners, Etienne Wenger and John Smith, as we went through this multi-year process of thinking about um, digital habitat, stewarding technology for communities. Because we started out thinking about traditional communities of practice, and I kept on saying, but this applies to different kinds of groups, to looser groups. And so this idea that there really is a continuum of group forms that can be made manifest online and it's important to think about what's similar or different across them. So I want to take a little bit closer look at these. This is also incredibly important because of what technology has done. So the combination of technology and the social has fundamentally changed what it means to be together. It's no longer necessary to gather in an office meeting place or in the cafeteria or on the lawn underneath a tree or at the coffee shop down the street, that we can gather, we can be together over time and distance in new ways. And increasingly in the mobile age, this means two people communicating electronically sitting on the couch across the room from each other. Now, sometimes I think this is crazy, but it's our reality. So this is the continuing shift of what it means to be together. And I'm waving my hands like a good Italian girl while I'm saying that. So wave your hands as you're listening. OK, good. So first, let's think about this continuum. Now, as I talk about these elements, Sometimes the line from one to the other is very blurred and indistinct. And in fact, I think this is actually a continuum or a circle. But it helps to talk about them sequentially to, to lay them out. So the first one is this going solo. Harold Jarke talks about personal knowledge management. Um, we talk about the free range learner. This is people thinking, focusing on their task exploring from a me-centric perspective. The second. And, and a form that I use a lot in my work is the very small groups, pairs, triads. This is where people can go deep, can go deep fairly economically in terms of conversation when you just have a few players. And you can do significant work. This is the, this is the place of work. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, I have to cough when I'm recording a narration. This builds on a lot of people's ideas. So think of Pierre Levy and reciprocal apprenticeships. And I encourage you to look at Pierre's current work. Um, this past year, he was a guest in the Change 11 Massively Open Online course. All the stuff you can find on, if you uh, search for Change 11, you'll find it. This idea that we're learning with and from each other, and how incredibly important it is. And when we think of both our work as professionals and what we learn with e from each other, for example, across institutions about your work with students, what we learn with and from students. I mean, the, the configurations are many. And this all generally happens at that fairly small level. That's not where the knowledge stops. The knowledge can flow much more in the larger groups. The next is the bounded group. So we're all headed in the same direction. We've agreed that this is our raison d'etre, and boom, we're a group. This has been the traditional model of associations, courses, many things in our lives. And this particular form has been significantly disrupted by changes in technology, and we'll come back to that. And finally, 
there's the network. And this is the one that has been incredibly enabled by new technologies, which is the associations of people um, across different interests and where those, inter those interests intersect. So networks are great places for people to discover, to disseminate, and for communities to form as the density of relationship increases. So we've got this me, we, and the network. So let's look a little bit at what distinguishes each of them. So me is about personal identity, trajectory, my interest, you know, what I want. We is where we're giving up a little bit of the me for the benefit of the we. So it's bounded membership. We know who's in and who's out. There's group identity. We are the Three Musketeers, or we are the soccer team that plays on Wednesday nights. We definitely know what our shared interest is. It is, doesn't need to be discovered. And our interactions tend to be very human-centered. Human in a network, we've got a more boundaryless, uh, fuzzy lines. We, we have relationships that intersect and around interests, often around content. Um, Yuri Ingstrom wrote about object-centered sociality, and I think he really nailed it for me that the way we begin to interact with each other is around a shared artifact rather than starting with a shared relationship, which turns on its head many of the assumptions we make about how we get to know each other and how we get to trust each other. So significantly different way of engaging with people than with bounded communities. Some of the things that sit underneath it is, for me, the consciousness of what I want. So if you're not self-aware, me is going to be a hard place to really focus your learning. Um, confidence level, risk tolerance, the styles uh, that we use to operate, to learn with, whether you believe in learning styles or not. Um, emotion, okay? In communities, there's a distinct power and trust dynamics, uh, shared for forward movement or strong blocking. It is easier to block in a bounded community than it is in a network. In a network, people just go around the block, like water goes around the rock in the river. Okay? There's more bonding. There can be more stasis, more attention to shared, to maintenance and shared language in communities. So some of the pluses here are we really know what we're doing. We know what direction we're headed in, and we can get it done. It also might mean groupthink, um, the inability to Think to allow new ideas in, it could become stale. With the networks, as I said, it flows around blocks. It's about bridging and brokering. Often less cohesion. Power is distributed, um, and things change often. It can be a very flexible place for innovation, for diversity of ideas, for creating new connections. It can be a more difficult place for coherence and forward movement. Okay, So you're starting to get the drift here that these different forms enable different things. And in fact, we use all of them all the time. They're really important in our work. But sometimes I think we're not too aware of them, differences. And we're not too strategic in the choices. And I think this is one of the invitations I want to make to you, as you think about your work together. When are each of these forms, or their places in between, most useful? And when should you be avoiding them? So there's also a technological implication. And for every place that I could slot a technology here, you could probably move it someplace else. So know that how we use technology is very creative and very flexible. But me is my email, journals, portfolios, Facebook page, etc. It has my, my identity stamped on it. I can turn it off and on. I can customize it. In the communities, there are tools that enable meetings, conferences, projects, which might be wikis, group blogs, or collaborative platforms. Again, they tend to have a login or sign in that legitimizes your participation as a member of group X or Y. On the network, we've got network-enabled tools, which interestingly are a lot of the me connected to the we. But they allow you to hop across the we's and as a me to determine how you want it set up. So it's Facebook, um, ELGG as a type of learning management system, which has a lot of personal choice, Twitter, YouTube, Wikipedia, etc. Um, Wikipedia is probably moving out of that space because of the way it's moderated. So we've got these different, different forms. So we need to think then, what are the roles that we take to activate, to facilitate, to utilize these forms? Okay. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about some groupings of things that we want to enable people to be able to do. 
So one is we want to be able to discover and appropriate useful technology. So when we make an offer to gather on platform X or Y, that we have a, a, an idea of how to help people do that. Second is to be in and use communities and networks. So tapping the people. These are social skills. These would be very traditional facilitation skills in many ways. The third is identity. And identity, because we can express it in different ways online, has become a very interesting and a pretty darn complex issue. And I'm not going to go too far into it, except to say, pay attention to it. And if you want to have a subsequent conversation on identity, contact me. Fourth is find and create content. Remember when I talked about Yuri Ingstrom's object-centered sociality? That if you aren't putting content out there, then there are people who won't find you because they find people via content. So the picture you put up on Flickr, the post you put up on Facebook, the tweet you put out, is actually a little pheromone that could attract someone else who might be interested in the same thing you are. And I didn't mean that sexually, but I guess it sort of came out that way. Oh, well. This is what happens when you record things and you think spontaneously, because uh, I don't believe in a script for this stuff, you guys. I believe in the power of passion. And finally, my favorite is usefully, usefully participate, okay? I think we can participate easily these days. And I'm not quite sure we're so good at usefully participating. And so the issues of wasted time or strategic use of groups and networks really comes into play. But from a role perspective, it's noticing what's working, bringing it to attention to people, complimenting someone when they do something skillfully, point it out to someone else. This is the social learning to help us usefully participate better. Social learning meaning learning with and from each other. If we translate these into roles, as I mentioned, facilitator is a long-standing role. Community leader, definitely important in those bounded communities. Technology stewards to help who know enough about uh, a community or a network's technology configuration to help set it up and run it, um, and enough about the community that they're serving to bend the technology to the needs of the community. Uh, network weavers, which is a June Hawley term, and I encourage you to look up June Hawley if you're interested in this. She has a new Network Weavers Handbook out that's really chock full of practical ideas. But these are people who think about connecting individuals in that more network-like uh, environment. Though a lot of her stuff applies to communities as well. For example, a classic is Closing Triangles. If you know two people who should meet each other, you know, what is the process of making introductions that has some chance of making it stick? And she goes through that, and you can just uh, Google Closing Triangles, and you can see a lot about that. We need independent thinkers, and I think networks have really helped us bring back the opportunity for critical thinking that may be lost in those bounded and more group-minded communities, because the free-flowing, less friction network makes it easier to live with diversity than closed and bounded groups. So when you think about really trying to stretch your practice when you're working with students. You don't want to always interact with the same people all the time or else you're not going to look for those edges where interesting things happen. And finally, there's moderators and the people who filter things and clean things up. And there's a lot of junk. And sometimes it's really helpful to have people who are helping do that work. Now, these are pretty generic roles. And you can think, what might they be in the communities that you're using with each other, with your students, or across those different places. What's useful? What do you need to learn more of? So the third thing I want to share is about how we think about activities as the glue for our online interaction. So this comes out of very classical communities of practice theory when we talk about domain community and practice. Domain being the thing we care about together, community being the people who care about it. And practice is a set of activities that comes in two layers. One is the activities that we do within a community or network with each other. And the other set of activities are the things we do to apply what we've learned out in the world to gather new learning and bring it back in. So practice has this lovely two layers that I just adore. Um, activities are ways to express that practice. And in the Digital Habitats book, we wrestled with this, and we looked across a variety of different communities, and sorry about that, started to realize there was a pattern of types of activities, which we call community orientations, and that in different communities, some of these were more important than others. So I want to briefly run through each one of these 
give you a couple of examples and talk about some of the implications and then I'm going to hand it back over to the team to talk about this in the context of the work they've been doing with the LEARN project and, and, and then I'll be back in my mind driving the car back to Vancouver. So um, the most common activities we found across most communities involved open-ended conversations and meetings. Okay? Now open-ended conversations are Q&A, an email listserv, people chatting during coffee at meetings, the stuff that doesn't have a structure but makes us accessible and available to each other over time in an easy way. Okay? Uh, online discussion forums, email lists, Twitter, uh, Facebook. Now we have lots, lots of options for these open-ended conversations. And they could be with bounded groups or out public to the world. The second is meetings. Now meetings for me have a beginning, middle, and an end, and an agenda, a purpose. So while open-ended conversation may wander around, a meeting says we're going to gather and share recipes for chocolate cookies on Wednesday at 3 p.m. at my house and bring your own cookie pan. Okay? Meetings give a moment of punctuation. Open-ended conversation can kind of flatten off and disappear, but a meeting brings all of our attention together at one time. So notice the difference between those two orientations. One is like a stream flowing on. Another is like the gong of a bell at midnight and at 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. and noon. Okay? The third, the, the second set that was most common were um, projects and content publishing. And interestingly, they often have a relationship. So projects is we want to do something by such and such a date, and it has interrelated tasks. People have roles. They agree on what's going to happen. And often they produce some output that could be content publishing. So you might have meaning meeting minutes, you might have project outputs, you might have summaries from conversations. So projects aren't the only thing that feed into content publishing. But because it's so easy to publish on the web, content publishing has gone way up from what it was even 10 years ago. Okay? Some of the other ones are access to expertise. You bring in the big gun who knows all about chocolate cookies and they have you know the detailed science of chocolate cookies and then the expert goes away because they can't diddle with the rest of us for too long. You know. Um, Access to expertise can also mean we know the different expertises. Is that good English? Bad English. Um, that that we have in the in in our group, and we tap we tap each other. So using profiles to understand who knows how to um, set up a Drupal website, or who knows how to work with multiple language student groups, and we we tap into that. Then coming down to the lower part of the orientation. Um, I think we, we think about relationships um, and community cultivation as related. In fact, if I were to redo this diagram, I'd probably put them closer together. So relationships is creating moments in time where people can get to know each other. This is about one-to-one -one or very small group and getting to know each other as individuals. Community cultivation is how much we want to be together, have a shared identity together. So some communities like a sports team, have a very strong community cultivation because they wear uniforms, for goodness sakes, that identify them as people of the same community. Other communities, you know, saying I am a member of X isn't that important, so community cultivation is less of an issue. Um, community cultivation sitting next to individual participation also has an interesting relationship. Individual participation means how easy do you make it for a person to participate on their own terms customization of tools, coming in and out, low barriers to entry, um, as opposed to community cultivation where one aspect of that might be you have to show up on this day, you have to do it that way. So these ha often have different um, degrees of importance in how they show up. And the final one is context, which is always the hardest to explain and doesn't fit into this kind of scale that you'll see in a moment, which is how internally or externally facing is the community. So a community of survivors of domestic violence is very internally focused because if they had their conversations in public, the people who are abusing them might find them and repeat that cycle of abuse. Um, a community that's about saving the world is going to be very externally oriented. They want to share what they know. They want to draw new people. So they have a very externally oriented context. Interestingly, we found many communities have both, 
But what they do externally is often quite different than what they do internally. And if you pick that apart, it, it makes a lot of sense. But I'm not going to go too much further into that from, from a time perspective. So um, we can think of these orientations as a way to understand which kind of tools we should pick to support our community. So if for meetings, we might want to have web meeting tools or shared calendars. Um, for content, we might want to have content management systems, blogs, wikis, podcasts, etc. So it has a technical implication. Go back to KM for Dev. Um, if everybody was doing everything when the community was small, those people would be burned out. As the community gets larger, I think you're going to see this this configuration look more like the Environmental Resource Network. So there's some ways to sort of suss out what's going on um, by looking at these spidergrams. And by the way, further out on the arrow means more of, th further to the middle means less of, except with context. And context, it's further towards the middle means it's internally oriented and further towards the out, outside is externally oriented. So you can compare them. They're different. They're different sizes. They're different purposes. They're probably different points in their lifetime. You can use this as an assessment tool. You can use it as a planning tool. You can use it to um, compare yesterday to tomorrow. And so it's, you know, a spidergram is an old tool. This is just using it in the context of looking at the activities that drive a community. Um, with that, and sorry about that little blip there, my little finger got too excited. Here's a couple more resources. Uh, I'm hoping to hear great stories about how the rest of your session goes. And thanks again for letting me be virtually part of your meeting today. Bye-bye.